I can say with certainty that the one word to describe this game would be arduous. One guy we were with even started taking off his clothes in excitement, but he was a bit weird. Anyway, the level design is the best it's ever been, and that's no exaggeration. I was afraid that this was gonna be another case of me coming back to an old favorite and hating it, and Man, I haven't skateboarded for years. I kinda miss it. I'ma go grab my board right now and go shred. I can't see how could this possibly go wrong. You know, maybe skateboarding has passed me by, but hey, I can still do the next best thing. I can play skateboarding-based electronic interactive entertainment. You mean video games? Shut up. I used to be a skateboarder once, you know. Spent six years doing it. I was never that good. In fact, it's fair to say that I was the worst out of everybody I knew, mostly due to being uncoordinated, unathletic, and generally a puss. But it was mostly just something to do. Even back then, I didn't want to stay inside and play video games all day. Oh, how things have changed. And skateboarding is something you don't need to be invited to do. I was more into it for the culture and the atmosphere of skateboarding rather than the act of it. The fuck authority attitude that surrounded the lifestyle, the balls to the wall, wake up tomorrow in pain if it means glory today image. It felt glamorous to me growing up, but the real deal was kind of meh. I gave up the ghost altogether in 2016. I just lost interest after high school. Too much work for very little payoff. I got too busy. And from my experiences, most skateboarders I met ended up being drug addled masochistic dicks anyway. Let's be honest. There are some people who are on the level, but not too, too many. As with many people, I was introduced to the concept of skateboarding in my youth through the medium of video games. And if you grew up around the same time as me, chances are you were introduced to skateboarding in one of two franchises, the EA Skate franchise or the Tony Hawk's whatever franchise, both of which have since died an undignified death. And today I wanted to take a special look at where it all began for me, the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater trilogy. You may be confused because there is also a Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4 before the Undergrounds and the Project 8s and the Proving Grounds and whatnot, but while there is a Pro Skater 4, I don't really count it because the series underwent a severe design overhaul, and while still good, Pro Skater 4 loses the feel of the classic trilogy, so I'm going to be mainly focusing on the original three, or as I call them, the two-minute trilogy, but usually just the trilogy for the sake of consistency. Also for the sake of consistency, I'm going to be mainly focusing on the PS1 versions of these games. So let's hop in and examine what made the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater trilogy so great, so well-remembered, and the cultural milestone that got so many kids into the sport only to realize that they suck. It's exactly what happened to me. So we start out with the original, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. The game that started it all, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater on PS1. A humble game that's fondly remembered, but if I were to give an award for worst game in the series not counting Rock well, that would go to the hot bucket of cynical horseshit that is 5. However, this game, the first game, would be second, but only because there were necessary improvements that were implemented later and stuck for the rest of the series. In other words, this game suffers from an inoperable case of first game syndrome, but the base experience is here. You have a series of levels that are intricately laid out for pulling off sick combos using strings of flip tricks, grabs, grinds, gaps, and point pickups. You have a two minute timer and a series of goals for each level, and your task is to get each of these goals done in those two minute rounds. The more you get done, the more levels open up, the more points you get get to level up your character, and then there are these competition levels where you have to get as many points as you can in three one-minute rounds. The more points you get in quick succession, the more you'll fill up your special meter, and if you fill it up, you can do a Street Fighter combo to do a special move. You can also do various grabs with the circle button, various flip tricks with the square button, various grinds and wall rides with the triangle button, and manual- wait, this game doesn't have a manual command? Well, that's a load of shit. Manuals are one of the best ways to string combos together. Without them, it kind of cuts your balls off gameplay-wise. See what I mean about necessary improvements that just weren't there yet? If I'm being honest as well, this game just feels slightly... stiff. Like, it's hard to explain. The controls feel the slightest bit delayed, and you don't quite have the same maneuverability as you would in other games. The movement just feels slightly sluggish, I guess, and I constantly feel like I have to fight against my character to go anywhere. Not helped by a frame rate that I would classify as unacceptable, which really didn't help the responsiveness of the controls. So even just aligning yourself up in the direction you wish to go is arduous. I would say that it's only a problem if you haven't played the later games, but it's really not. This game just doesn't feel good. The movement is not smooth. Maybe this wouldn't be so bad if this were my first Tony Hawk's Pro Skate 
Gator game, but as a matter of fact, I think this was the final game in the series I played, with the exception of Proving Ground, but by that point I was over the series, so to say I played it would be a gross overstatement as I packed it in after like an hour or so. So the OG THPS game was probably the last one I played all the way through, and honestly, that was probably a mistake, because now having played this game all the way through again, I can say with certainty that the one word to describe this game would be arduous. Playing through to campaign end was one of the most frustrating few hours of my life. I don't think I've ever had to describe the controls in a Tony Hawk game as unresponsive, but the big thing here is that if you press the next button prompt while that animation is still playing out, it won't register once the animation is finished playing out, even if you're holding down the next button. That may not sound huge, but this is a game that demands precise button presses a hundred times a minute, so when this game isn't cooperating when I need it to, I end up not doing the full trick I want to do and lose out on points. Did I mention the point requirements in some of these levels are ridiculously hard requiring a perfect run? Hard to get a perfect run when I misjudge the amount of time to press the next button by a fifth of a second and lose the trick. God, the only thing this bad on a skateboard is... me. On a skateboard. Oh my god, getting up after bailing is so slow. Get up, you're wasting time! And another major issue, this game is really unforgiving in terms of how easy it is to bail. There were several times when I would bail just by brushing up against a wall mid-combo, and at least this game has a quick restart option, which is good because I had to use that more than the ollie button. If you're going for a point score and screw up your first trick, you might as well just restart, it's better than losing two minutes of your life to it. Even worse is just generally landing. Later games had a cleanliness system that meant that if you land your trick off-center, it would still give you the trick but give you a sloppy rank, which would reduce your your total points, but it meant that you could reward good landings while still being fair. The margin for error when landing in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater is very unforgiving. If you don't land perfectly or almost perfectly, you bail over and over. And it's just generally way too easy to bail. Sometimes just ollieing in the wrong spot while standing still will have you bail. None of this would be so bad, but the unforgiving bailing system crossed with the sluggish and unresponsive controls crossed with the lack of ways to rack up combos makes for a purely frustrating system. This game does this weird thing where if you air off a half pipe, you'll automatically rotate 180 degrees so you don't land switch. This alone makes you bail sometimes because if you do a trick you'll stop rotating while the trick is going. So there were times when I was trying to activate a special and if I took slightly too long then the trick would activate sideways and I wouldn't know until I already bailed. I thought all of this may have been me because at one point after nearly an hour of going for the pro score in the Minneapolis level I entered this almost elevated state of awareness where I suddenly absolutely nailed everything and got the pro score in less than a minute and that was fun. And furthermore in the early game before the game ramps up I was actually having a lot of fun, but that was short-lived. As soon as this game ramped up, the control issues and gameplay shortcomings become more and more apparent. But the fact that I actually found myself having fun from time to time shows me that this game was so close to being good, but fell short. While up till now, I've only been talking about what this game did wrong. To be clear, for all of this game's insubstantiality and unrefinement, it still has the basics down. This game is unashamedly arcadey, and so one of the big things that benefits it are no transitionary animations. You click triangle next to a rail, and you snap right to it once you're within a certain range, and so the the controls in some ways are actually ultra responsive. There's a lot of skill and practice required to pull off those sick long ass combos, especially with the rail balance mini games. The selection of levels, while limited, does give you a good range of environments and set pieces, and the level design is actually pretty good for the most part. I was gonna come on here and complain, but on reflection, there was way more good than bad, particularly the downhill levels. Even though they automatically end once you get to the bottom, traveling in a linear direction with a series of obstacles in your way, that actually really works with the weaker controls. Warehouse, Burnside, and Roswell are also really good. Hey, Burnside, Portland. I've been there. I think the only ones that didn't work were School, Minneapolis, and Chicago because the designs were way too loose. The skate spots were few and far between and could even be hard to skate in general. Otherwise, you have a nice selection of pro skaters to choose from, from the titular Tony Hawk to Chad Muska to Bob Burnquist to Elisa Steamer, who funnily has her age as undisclosed. Also, if you collect all 30 secret tapes with any character, there's a hidden character named Officer Dick. I get it. A rent-a-cop who I'm pretty sure is a rib on how the police and security are always out to get skateboarders, and let me tell you from experience, that's how it definitely feels in many ways, but they're more so just after anyone causing a ruckus on private property. Then again, it varies from officer to officer. I remember there was this one time where me and my friends were out late skating spots, well, they were skating spots, I was just there. So they were all getting their shit in, and we were confronted by a security officer. One of my friends, who was the only one who hadn't gotten his shit in, was trying to double kick flip the 10 stair, but the security officer was a nice guy who was basically telling us that the longer we stay, the more likely he'll get in trouble, so we basically struck a deal that this would be our last trick that any of us would 
do, and five tries later, my friend landed the double kickflip, and we all flipped our shit. One guy we were with even started taking off his clothes in excitement, but he was a bit weird. Anyway, we shook the security officer's hand and went on our way. It was probably the only time I can think of that security didn't feel like a nuisance, but of course, now that I'm older, I know that they were just doing their jobs. So there's plenty of characters to choose from, each with a different stance, move list, and special moves. So to those inclined, you can choose from a roster of different skateboarders, but they all play functionally the same, and here we come to one of the biggest issues with Pro Skater 1. It's very insubstantial. With every clear, that is to say three gold medal wins, you get compressed as hell video footage of the character you just finished the game with, which is a pretty sweet time capsule of how skateboarding was in the late 90s, but otherwise, this game has absolutely no replay value because you've gotten the essential experience after one playthrough, and even then, there are only five tasks per level. Add to that the fact that this game has nothing beyond the career mode, and it ends up feeling very barren, but if you want these skate videos, don't touch the N64 version because they were cut for space. But because there's nothing this game can really reward you with, the gameplay is like pulling teeth and there being next to no content, there really is nothing to recommend. The essential fixes that had yet to be implemented means the combos are hard to pull off, so the essential competitions were needlessly frustrating. One thing the Pro Skater series is known for are cheats, but Pro Skater 1 doesn't even take that as far as it could. You have your standard big head mode, turbo mode, level select, and so on, but no moon gravity, no perfect grind, no disco mode. Once again, is it fair to compare this game to its later installments? Well, if the later installments did the exact same thing but better, then yes. And even on its own merits, Pro Skater 1 is just arduous to play. After a while, I just started activating cheats to get through easier, and by the 5 hour mark, I was already super pissed off, so trying at that point to get all the cheats to work and them not cooperating, I just gave up. Now that said, the one thing that most people would say is the most memorable thing about all these games are the soundtracks. Between these games and Rock Band, video games basically shaped my taste in music from the start. In fitting with the subculture feel, they tended to emphasize punk, hard rock, and metal. These games introduced me to so many different artists. Motorhead, The Dead Kennedys, Papa Roach, The Ramones, Goldfinger, Suicidal Tendencies, AFI, Zebrahead, Body Jar, and so on. And the soundtrack for one, while I find it to be the weakest overall, still has a ton of great music. Of course, because this is a licensed soundtrack, I can't really show it to you, but some of the highlights for me would be Superman by Goldfinger. Man, if I had a dollar for every pixel in that picture, I'd have 50 cents. Oh wait, I already made that joke. Police Truck by the Dead Kennedys, wow that is a really offensive name. Although the censorship does kind of butcher it a bit, and Euro Barge by the Vandals. If you do plan on picking up any of these games, don't touch the N64 version. The lack of cartridge space forced them to butcher the music into glorified 10 second loops, which I'm pretty sure would give PTSD flashbacks to those who grew up with Napster. Also, what I find really cool that the later games didn't do is that there will be TVs in each environment playing music videos for each song. Of the three games, I think this soundtrack is the weakest for two reasons. One, many songs here are good instrumentally with less than pleasant vocals, and two, there's just not enough with only 10 songs, where later games would practically multiply that. So while the first Tony Hawk's Pro Skater soundtrack is good, it leaves me wanting more, and the soundtrack is a key example of one of this game's biggest shortcomings. As I said before, this game I think suffers from first game syndrome, where it almost feels like a budget title compared to the later games, because the series had yet to make any money to expand. Small soundtrack, shallow unrefined mechanics, and a severe lack of content. They got the basics down, and there is some fun to be had in parts. All they need to do is expand a upon what they had here and they'd have something, which they did, but with that, the very first Tony Hawk's Pro Skater game definitely feels more shallow and unrefined than anything, and because literally everything this game did was fixed in later games, add to that the severely unrefined mechanics, and the 5 hours I spent playing this game was one of the most frustrating 5 hours of my life, of which maybe 30 minutes is usable footage, and if I didn't force myself to, I wouldn't have finished it. This game can't help but to have aged incredibly poorly, and in the context of the series as a whole, is borderline unplayable comparatively. Some people will say that this is up there with with the greatest skateboarding games of all time, probably people who haven't played it recently, but I know that there's a good game in here somewhere, so Tony Hawk's Pro Skater gets a 4 out of 10. Next up we have Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. Now, this one's been a long time coming because this is another on the list of first games I got when I got my PlayStation. I didn't have it for very long because my parents returned it when they saw that it had blood in it. Oh man, there's blood when you bail on a skateboard? Slow down, Lloyd Kaufman! But I did play the shit out of it, and let me tell you, after the sheer frustration that was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1, I was afraid that this was gonna be another case of me coming back to an old favorite and hating it, and let me just tell you, there ain't gonna be no breakdown, I ain't tired of playing this game, because this was the day that I was proven wrong. Sorry, I just threw up a bit. 
and I was proven wrong immediately. Literally within the first minute of playing, I thought to myself, now that's more like it. If I were to give this one a subtitle, it would be more but better. While it still had a long way to go, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 made significant and necessary improvements in quality of life changes that made this game a big step up and much, much more enjoyable on a moment to moment basis. As before, this game is split into several levels where you need to accomplish a bunch of area specific tasks in each level, and then there are these competition levels where you have to get as many points as possible in three one minute heats. This time, there's more to completion than just doing the tasks as well, as each level has a completion percentage. Even the competition levels have this, and that's because each level has money in secret areas all over the map for you to collect, which adds some more depth to the completion and gives you more of a reason to explore and find secrets all the more. So what does this game improve over the first game? Well, if I'm being honest, it would probably be easier to list all the ways this game doesn't improve over the original. You know, I can't think of anything. Literally nothing. For one, the controls are way more responsive, like at least 500% more responsive. Where before, the only thing I could really call snappy was the grinding. Everything you do here is way more snappy. It feels so fluid and natural to pull off tricks to get combos going. The second major thing this game adds is the aforementioned trick ranking system. So landing tricks is much easier as the margin for error is much wider, but if you don't land it properly, you'll lose some of your momentum and get the sloppy rank, which will reduce your total score. But if you land perfectly, you get bonus points. This is an addition that plays into one of my big philosophies of game game design. Games need to reward you for getting better at the game rather than punish you for not getting better at the game, and this system that makes the tricks fairly easy to land but with the added finesse of getting the tricks perfect giving you extra points means that you have room to grow but you can basically get the job done without needing to practice for ages. What the hell is the landing alignment for the judo grab? The skill floor is low, but the skill ceiling is high. Very, very high. And that's just the way I like it. Even generally, it seems much less easy to make yourself bail. You don't usually bail when ollieing near a wall or curved surface. If you're still doing a trick when you land, as long as you're lining up properly, you'll land the trick. Furthermore, the other big addition that they added were the manuals, which means it's much easier to string combos together, much easier to rack up points, and much easier just to goddamn play the game. And wall rides give you points for the full ride, now like a grind as opposed to just when you jump off like a flip trick. Even the general maneuverability is better, it just feels better and more smooth to move around the environments. Suddenly, almost everything just feels so much better about this game. Scratch that, everything about this game feels so much better. Oh my god. You can just mash buttons in this game to get up faster? Best game ever! They really took the solid base they had and refined it and refined it until it's as tight as a pickle jar. In general, this game is structured basically the exact same as the first, but with some pretty big changes. First of all, instead of each level having 5 tasks to do, this game has 10 per level, so you have more of a chance to explore and play around these levels and conquer all the unique areas and special challenge spots, and the levels have stepped up big time from the first game. They're bigger and more intricate. The opening level hangar is a bit compact, but with plenty of places to shred for massive combos and point scores. It even has some pretty sweet secrets. New York is a surprisingly big level to explore. It's split into four major parts, the streets, the park, the subway, and the secret area, and as ever, there's a bunch of intricately designed areas built for tremendous combos. I think my favorite part of this level is just how atmospheric it is. The run-down, dismal look, the crazy taxi drivers that run you down. Moving your mother Oh, yes, stereotype. A motherfucker I may be, but the mother I fuck belongs to thee. And this one area in particular on the river's edge always stuck out to me. Half close your eyes and you feel like you're in New York. The competition in Marcel, France is a really tightly designed level with a bunch of sequences of obstacles for you to conquer. The bull ring is really well designed with a centralized point with a half pipe that sprawls out into a bunch of different spots, including the titular bull ring. And this game is great because what other game can you ride your skateboard through literal bullshit? I can't think of any. Probably for a good reason, actually. One of the levels is loosely based on Carlsbad High School, California, because if you make your way over this wall, you'll find yourself in a virtual recreation of the famous Carlsbad Grass Gap, which is a neat little easter egg, but is slightly depressing in hindsight. While this gap was very famous in the 90s and 2000s, it was sadly torn down during a renovation in 2012, so it's a piece of skateboarding history that's gone forever. But this level is great because it's massive, and every area has a plethora of great spots to shred. Gaps ahoy and fun verticality. I think for the sheer scope and integration of each spot into to the next that this level might just be the best level in the entire series full stop. Although it is competing with a lot of great levels so that's a bit up in the air. The only example of a level I think is kind of weak is the Philadelphia level because it's really flat over large and the spots aren't really good. Holy shit! Oh, and she just gets right up from that? Oh wow, that's determination. <laughs> I mean they get hit by a bus and they walk it off. I stub my toe, I'm out for six months.
The best part of this level is the secret area. Yeah, this is pretty good, but the good parts are locked behind a secret wall while the rest of the level is weak. Okay. That's kind of backward. Also, Skate Street is kind of weak because while it's based on a real skate park, the design is a bit messy, so you end up getting caught in the busy scenery. Otherwise, the level design is top-notch. They did get rid of the downhill levels from one, which could be considered a shame because those were the best levels, but those levels were really only the best because of the skewed mechanics. If the level design here is great and the gameplay is great, which they are, then I'm fine with or without the downhill levels. The replayability here is very high. I think that one of my favorite parts of the game is once you complete somebody's career mode, you unlock a cheat that can be activated in the options menu. You have everything from controlling your character's weight to controlling the game's speed, moon gravity, perfect balance, removing the textures, disco mode, and so on and so forth. And let me just tell you, the existential dread of seeing the already slightly nutty Rodney Mullen be reduced to a near skeletal husk is something that will haunt my dreams forever. Look at that fucker. Looks like he's been hollowed. Then if you create a character with maximum weight combined with the maximum weight of the cheat, you end up skating around as Jabba the Hutt, who clips through himself like a motherfucker. So there's plenty of excitement in never knowing what you'll unlock with each playthrough, and each cheat is usable in every mode, including the campaign. There are even some other unlockables, like the aforementioned Officer Dick, or even Spider-Man. HOLY SHIT! IT'S SPIDER-MAN! No joke, this game was being made by Neversoft alongside Spider-Man, and so as a promotional tactic, they added Spider-Man as a playable character with his own special moves and alternate costumes. Something about that is so cool. If you're too impatient, there's also a cheat you can punch in that will unlock everything, including the secret stages. You have a small level that's a helicopter drop, which is a large half pipe with a big jump surrounded by water, which is pretty cool, but probably the best level in the game is the final unlockable level, Skater Heaven. Jesus Christ. Literally. It's massive, and every section has something new to offer. I even spent some time trying to pitch myself into the volcano, but the same thing happens then as when you just fall off the map. You respawn. Oh yeah, and also God laughs at you. <laughs> you know, that's analogous to my everyday life, just much less subtle. The set pieces in these levels are great. Tell me you didn't giggle like a schoolgirl the very first time you grinded the entirety of the subway rails, or when you did the loop-de-loop -loop in the bull ring, or the rooftop area in the school, and so on. There are so many intricately designed areas with great sequences of set pieces with a massive amount of opportunities for combos, which are always satisfying to pull off, many of which are also accompanied by a gap. So the tight as hell level design and great layouts means that the opportunities for massive points and tremendous combos are frequent, and pulling off those combos are never not a fantastic sense of accomplishment. And best of all, there are secret areas in almost every level for you to unlock and discover. Right from the first level, you can unlock the door to the outside area when you grind the helicopter blades, or the wind tunnel when you grind these propellers. Then there are areas like the underground pit in Marcel, the entire back half of New York, and so on. The roster this time around has a lot of returns, including Officer Dick with a sillier design, but also has some new people like Steve Calabero, I think that's how it's pronounced, and Eric Costin, but there are enough skaters here for there to be someone for everyone, and they also include a short bio for each skater, which is actually a really cool inclusion, and a time capsule of how each of these skaters got to where they were, but if you're not interested in playing as any of those characters, I've got something for you. They introduce the concept of creatable characters here, and so you can skate around as yourself, or some sort of racist archetype if you're an absolute bastard, and you can fully customize their move list, and better yet, this game has theoretically infinite content because of the part creator. The UI is a bit confusing, like how the shoulder buttons and triggers work vertically instead of horizontally, which is really confusing, like L1 and L2 scroll through primary item sets, and R1 and R2 scroll through the items that are in that set, which feels like it should be L1, R1, L2, R2. In any case, with the different sets of environments and layouts, you can end up with all kinds of different park layouts, with custom gaps and massive ramps. There are infinite possibilities. I've always liked custom park editors and skateboarding games. I sunk embarrassing amounts of time into the Skate 3 Park Editor. I always prefer outdoor levels because they feel more atmospheric and less claustrophobic. There's something inherently cool about skateboarding after dark. I constructed one of my go-tos, two massive ramps that overlook a death pit, and two quarter pipes on either side. Even just playing around in the pre-made parks is literal hours of fun, so the park creation tool is probably the best innovation in the game for creatives like me. The soundtrack is a big up as well. I suppose with the expanded budget, they were probably able to license more and better music, so as far as the selection of music goes, it's more akin to what I'd listen to. This game came out in late 2000, which was when new metal was beginning its rise, and so you have a selection of recognizable names in that regard. Blood Brothers by Papa Roach, Gorilla Radio by Rage Against the Machine, You by Bad Religion, May 16th by Lagwagon, which I've always thought sounds like it's part of an after-school special for some reason. And then you have a selection of actually good hip-hop. I'm not against hip-hop, I'm just against most modern hip-hop because it all fucking sucks. You got Cyclone by The Dub Pistols, Out With The Old by Alley Life and Black Planet, and a name that I actually recognize recognize Subculture by Styles of Beyond. Fittingly, in this case, I remember the name from... remember the name. Oh dear, I've gone cross-eyed. I don't think that I can point to a single track and say that I didn't like it. I think the one song that I identify with the most is No 
Bazaar by Melancholin because it's a song about standing out from the crowd and being proud to do so, which is something that really resonated with me, especially in my later high school years. They all have that distinctly early 2000s vibe that appeals to me. There was a distinct grit to the counterculture music of that time that I really liked, which is funny because I didn't even start listening to music regularly until 2009 when I heard a sampling of 80s and 90s era metal, so I don't know. Either way, the soundtrack is pretty good, and front to back, overall, I think this game is a massive step up from the first game. It took every problem and fixed all of them. Literally, there's not one thing that I can really point to and say wasn't improved. From moment one, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 feels, looks, and plays better than the first game, and is simply a game that oozes with fun, energetic excitement, with nothing that gets in your way. Not controls, not level design, nothing. There are a few areas that it can improve somewhat, but there's not one area in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay that isn't top-notch or close to top-notch. 8 out of 10. And if you get sick of it, there's also the Matt Hoffman demo on the disc, if you're so inclined. It's hard for me to think about how the gameplay system can get any better, but if you were to ask me, I think that Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 just squeaks out as the best. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 is the one I played the most, and for good reason. It has everything that made 2 such a great game, and while there are no major innovations, there are several points of refinement, taking everything that hypothetically wasn't as good as it could have been and making it better. Of course, this game came out on everything. PS2, PS1, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, Maximum Over Game Boy, N64, Windows, GameCube, GameSphere, Sphericle! Xbox, Engage, Zebo, Jaguar, Pile of Used Toilet Paper, you name it. Some of those may be incorrect. It was even the N64's last game, and credit to the thing, it was a great way to go out. While the main versions were made by Neversoft, various other versions were handed off to other developers, and in the PS1's case, it was ported by Shabba Games, a fairly unknown developer most famous probably for Shrek Super Slam and the good version of Web of Shadows. This being the last-gen version at the point of its release, it's rather scaled back compared to its next-gen counterparts, but just being a slight downgrade of the next-gen version still puts this up there as one of the best skateboarding games of all time. Let's go down the list of things that Pro Skater 2 does better than 3. Don't worry, it's short. First of all, I find that these levels feel more dead than in 2, even though the early games were far from lively, but especially in 2, they at least made sure to have something in the environment moving around to indicate that this wasn't just a ghost town. Unfortunately, for all of this game's sprawling environments, they're so devoid of life that it's almost eerie. The next-gen version solves this. 2, the graphics somehow look flatter, like for some reason a lot of the menu interface has lost the juiciness that it had in previous games, which I think has to do with it being a direct rip of the menus and whatnot from the next-gen version just without any of the processor-heavy stuff. 3. The comic book character included in this game, in this case Wolverine, isn't unlocked by doing everything, but rather by doing every gap in this game, which trust me is damn near impossible, and there's no cheat to unlock everything like before. That said, all of these things are nitpicks, and beyond that, this game is on the border of perfect. So once again, the big goal is to complete a set of objectives in a set of levels, and then go on to three competitions, which getting gold in all three will unlock some skate footage, and getting 100% will unlock a new cheat. This time, the 100% completion MacGuffin instead of money is skill points which you have to manually collect instead of buying. So far, so similar, but what does this game do to improve over the last one? Many little things. One of the main things that the series would do going forward is add various moves every game that makes stringing combos together easier, and after a while it got overbearing. I think that 3 nails the balance of having enough moves that you always have something for every situation, but not so many moves that it becomes overwhelming, and you have to be creative with how you navigate these environments. The big thing they added this time around is the ability to revert. This may not seem big, but what this means is that when you come off a half pipe and press R2 with the correct timing, you'll continue your combo from there and you can manual and get to the other side of the half pipe for more tricks. Unlike before when there were no ways to continue a half pipe combo, the ability to continue a half pipe combo is ultra significant. Manual aside, this is probably the most important addition in the series history because it eliminates the limitation of your combos, meaning that you can continue a combo in any situation. Coming off a half pipe, going on a rail, going to a manual, it's all there and the potential for literal 100,000 point combos have never been easier while simultaneously keeping the skill factor and sense of accomplishment. Once again, rewarding you for learning how to play the game rather than punishing you for not learning, even more so than 2. Secondly, the level design is the best it's ever been, and that's no exaggeration. Boundary is up there as one of the best levels in the series, it's so tightly designed, with every spot tying into the next seamlessly, so it's easy to get 20 plus combos. There's a bunch of verticality with the path of rafters and whatnot, it seems that all three of the first levels in the trilogy are small but compact and tightly designed, but Foundry gets it the best of all. What this game gets is that even in the more open level, 
levels, there should always be ways to rack up points in every situation, such as in the Los Angeles level. It's split into a bunch of different spots broken up by short straightaways, but all of those straightaways have something that you can do to grind on, jump on, and so on. And the sheer scale of this level is incredible. It's based off the next gen level where you cause an earthquake, which is already triggered here, probably because of loading time issues. Regardless, the amount of verticality in this level is stunning, including the secret tape location, which is the literal highest point in the level, except for maybe the elevator. And the elevator grind, man, that is epic. Rio de Janeiro is great because it has the design structure of three circles within each other. You have the inner circle, which is where the primary park is, which is compact and well designed. Then you have the middle circle, which is the connecting road. And then you have the outer circle, which is where all the secret areas are. I could go over every single level, but the point is they all kick ass. Unlike before, I can't really think of a single dud as far as the level design is concerned. Best of all, while they didn't bring back the whole concept of the downhill level, they brought it back in spirit with the likes of the airport and downhill. Waka waka. The best thing about them is that unlike downhill levels of yore, they don't immediately end as soon as you get to the bottom, and in fact the best parts of them are arguably at the bottom. Airport has multiple ways to go, you can go down the escalators or grind on the ceiling lights, there's so much to this level. Though regarding downhill, I have to speculate that there were probably a bunch of Brazilians working for Neversoft around this time, because downhill is the second level set in Rio de Janeiro. How do I know? That. Aw, oh, Jesus needs a hug. Or maybe he just glitched into his tipos and it makes me want to cry and throw my hands onto the sky. What each level benefits from is that they all work really well, but they also each work for slightly unique reasons. So it's not just the fact that this game has the best level design on average, but it also has the most varied level design. If there's one thing that this game takes full advantage of, it's the aforementioned verticality. This game goes vertical like your mum goes horizontal. Every level utilizes this aspect, most of all the Tokyo level. If you ever wanted to practice insane tricks with almost endless combos, then this is your place. If there's one gripe I have, it's with the Canada level. No, not the level itself because it's a great level, especially with spots like the shops, the upper mountains, and the massive sign, but it's more so with the name. I don't know why, but in pretty much every single piece of American media I've ever seen that goes into Canada, it always refers to it simply as Canada, as opposed to any specific location, and the area called Canada is usually this vaguely generic northern looking area. It's not like Canada is the second biggest country in the world or anything. Ontario is very different from Nova Scotia, which is very different from British Columbia, which is very different from the Yukon, and they're all very different from Alberta, which is basically our equivalent of Texas by way of Florida with the climate of Alaska and is filled with exclusively backwater country bumpkins so inbred they're practically sandwiches. Point is, stop referring to Canada as one thing, America. Although Alberta is good for one thing, the entire province is so flat you can watch your dog run away for days. Otherwise, there's not much to cover here that hasn't been thoroughly covered in the other games. I don't know. There's like a tree explosion. That's pretty cool. It should be mentioned that this game doesn't have blood at all, and it's the only one in the trilogy that doesn't. You could probably guess which one my parents liked the most. In my experiences though, blood is the least of it when it comes to bales like this. I myself have sprained my ankle twice, cracked my tailbone, and tore up my left wrist when I bailed palm down. I still feel that one, and that was just me. I knew a guy who could do a triple kickflip on flat, then completely destroyed his back and had to stop skateboarding. One guy I knew tore up his ankle in the middle of summer and couldn't do anything for the rest of summer, and another guy I knew completely destroyed his ankle, like complete break. Funny thing was, it was right before graduation, so he had to walk across the stage on that foot. Talk about a wincer. The roster this time around is basically the same as it was before, with some minor redesigns, like how Jimmy Thomas looks like Freddy Krueger by way of a skinhead. The most major addition is Bam Margera. You know? That guy who is most famous for making an ass out of himself on TV. Yeah, yeah, glass houses. As ever, there's someone for everyone, and everyone has a different trick list and stat list. This time, the customization options are basically the same, from the character creator to the part creator, with the only notable difference being that you have a new location. Shop smart, shop S smart. This time, I opted to make my custom character look like the lead singer of The Offspring wearing a terrible sweater. What can I say, I like the offspring. Otherwise, the customization options have all the appeal and replayability that they had before, and in general, this game has all the replayability that it had before, and aside from a downgraded, more bland menu interface, there's not much that I can really think of in terms of flaws. You also get to collect new decks, which each have different stats. It occurs to me that while it's cool to have different decks you can ride around on, you can't really see the bottom of the deck, so it's entirely pointless, but that's a nitpick. So as far as the soundtrack, of the three, I think Pro Skater 3 has the best soundtrack. I think that the previous two had some dead spots in the soundtrack, 
track, and if not, they had some songs that were clearly weaker than the others. I think they put the licensing dollar to great use this time around, and shelled out for some heavy hitters. Blitzkrieg Bop by the Ramones, Ace of Spades by Motorhead, The Boy Who Destroyed the World by AFI, Wish by Alien Ant Farm, who I think get way too much shit, Fight Like a Brave by the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Check by Zebrahead, and of course the next gen version has an extended song listing, but they have the best songs in both. I think the one that has always stuck with me is not the same by Body Jar. I've never really gone out of my way to listen to Body Jar, but this is a song that really resonates with me. It's a song about someone walking away from a relationship because the person he's with has changed and he feels he's better off without the person or people. It doesn't refer to any specific relationship status, so it could be a platonic relationship, it could be a significant other, a family member. You are not the same, you've changed, I don't need you anyway, you're not the person that I believed in yesterday. The reason this has stuck with me is that back in 2012, I heard it while replaying the game. It basically described my relationship with my friends at the time. Fittingly, the people I skateboarded with all collectively decided that they hated me, but none of them had the balls to tell me to get fucked, and so it kickstarted a very long period of emotional abuse that only got worse when the new kid came in, who really hated me and wasn't afraid to show it. Which was really the cherry on top of everything going on at the time, though I can't really recall many relationships pre-graduation that didn't involve some level of physical or emotional abuse. You know, it's funny, I don't often really consider how much I'm holding on to until an anecdote spirals into lamenting about the past. God, I'm just as bad as Fred Durst. Actually, nobody's as bad as Fred Durst. So, we were talking about soundtracks a minute ago. The groundwork for my taste in music was formed by this game. They seemed to combine the best aspects of the soundtrack from the first and second games, cut the dead weight, and added a splash of Motorhead. And there is no such thing as too much Motorhead. If hell is real, I imagine that when Lemmy died, he walked up to Satan's throne, threw Satan off the throne, sat down, and said, hey, thanks for keeping my seat warm. Overall, when it comes to Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 on PS1, it's basically at heart just Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 again, but with some tweaks and minor improvements, and if I'm being honest, that's enough. It basically takes everything we had that was great and makes it as close to perfect as it could have possibly been. For some aspects, the margin for improvement was very narrow, and for other things it's wider, but the point is, this game takes the established aspects and refines it to make theoretically what could be considered the perfect Tony Hawk game for the hardware. Would you believe that the next-gen versions are even better with a whole heap of extra content? Not only that, they're the only Xbox, PS2, etc. games with a two-minute system other than the remaster on Xbox. The PS1 version does seem like the end of an era, and it doesn't matter which version of this game you play, they're all great. But the PS1 version specifically? 9 out of 10. As I mentioned, we're gonna stop there because there are too many Tony Hawk games to give the spotlight in one go, and I wanted to touch on these ones specifically because the original three were the only ones with this specific design. After this, they started to add open world elements, stories, and eventually so many different mechanics that it started to become overwhelming and at times redundant. So after all that, what is it that makes the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 minute trilogy so great, or at least 2 and 3? My answer would be the purity of experience. These games are instant gratification in video game form because while the gameplay is an incredibly fast-paced, exciting, adrenaline-pumping ride that has a low skill floor but an incredibly high skill ceiling that makes it fun to learn the ins and outs of the game to master it, there's also nothing that gets in between you and the fun. Recently, I played and beat Spider-Man PS4, and in my opinion, that is a fucking excellent game. But while the potential for a completely pure experience without anything getting in the way of the fun is there, it has too many points where the fun is interrupted for one reason or another, which makes sense, but still. Another thing to note is that while the later Tony Hawk games are still fun, they lose an important part of what made the first game so great, because they lose the two-minute timer and opt to open up, but that only makes it so you have to trek around the levels and seek out objectives, and the games beyond that opted to have horribly written stories that constantly got in the way of the action, where plonking you in a level and giving you a two-minute timer, objectives, and letting you figure it out, that was perfect. That was as complex as it ever needed to be. Nothing got between you and your fun, where later games' only innovations were to put things between you and your fun, and I do think that a lot of these later games are great, American Wasteland particularly, but the purity of experience is something that they could never get again. If I'm being honest, it's actually been so long since I've been able to just sit down and enjoy a game that actually playing these games has put a lot of things into perspective. Playing 2 and 3, I was actually giddy while playing them I was having such a good time, and I can't remember the last time I actually felt that way. It's been such a long time since I've been able to just have fun with a game, with nothing getting in my way. These games are pure, unfiltered fun, and there are too many games these days that somehow think that they're better than that. That's the appeal of these games. That's why they hold up. That's why they're legendary. It's funny looking back on gaming in the 90s, back when it was in the process of going mainstream, it was still very counterculture, which I guess is why it went so well with skateboarding, which is still to this day counterculture. You know, playing the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater trilogy was like taking a deep, long breath of fresh air after a long period of stagnation. 
While I may not be interested in skateboarding as an active sport these days, at least two thirds of the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater trilogy is just the most purest essence of fun that I've played in a very long time. And you know, sometimes that's all you need. And you know, I kind of fancy playing some more of these games. You know, you know I'm gonna play as Rune Glyphberg, the all-terrain ta- oh. Wow. This is aged poorly. This video was brought to you in part by my lovely patrons. I thank you for your continued support. If you want to become a patron for TGX, the link is in the description. You know, it's funny. I was initially going to dissect the graphics in these games, but, you know, it's, it's a case of what do you really expect. And seeing as this is a compilation retrospective, it would probably be a little bit redundant to talk about the graphics in all three. The same goes for, like, the Nolly and the Fakey system, because A, they didn't really come into things, I, I use them so rarely, and B, doesn't really matter to the game as a whole. Although Alberta is good for one thing, the entire province is so flat you can watch your dog run away for days. Also, Alberta's so flat that if you stand on a stool and look into the horizon, you'll see the back of your head. You know, I couldn't find a way to integrate this rant into the video itself, but can I honestly just say, I think Tony Hawk's overrated. I hate the word overrated, but I think this is one of the few exceptions I can actually use that, because looking at his record, I feel like it's kind of warranted. Yes, he is the mainstream skateboarding star, but really, he benefited from basically being what, uh, you know, um, what is the modern standard of skill back in like the 80s and 90s, where I don't think he would be anything special if he was just getting a start these days. Maybe he would be special, but maybe not, but I don't think he'd be like a mainstream star. Personally, like my favorite skateboarder is Danny Way, who I actually consider basically the hipster's Tony Hawk, because the thing is, He's never really gotten the recognition he deserves because he deserves to be, like, in my opinion, the, of the stature that Tony Hawk has, uh, like the mainstream star and whatnot, because he is a nut job. He is, like, crazy with the type of stuff he does. I mean, to be honest, I'm still kind of salty that, to my knowledge, he was snubbed for the entirety of the Tony Hawk series. Like, he never made it into the Tony Hawk series, even though he's easily better than every single person who probably ever appeared in any of those, any of those games. He literally invented, invented a new type of skateboarding. He invented the concept of the mega ramp. Not only that, but he has set like multiple, multiple world records. Uh, he at one point was a pro in like four different sports. Uh, and then like, well, at one point he broke his neck. And then when he came back, he decided just to, I think, to just go into skateboarding, uh, like to stick to skateboarding. And it's just, and, and also like kind of his claim to fame, even though it's not the world record, he literally gapped the Great Wall of China. Let me say that again. He gapped the Great Wall of China. They built a ramp, and he went from one side over to the other. Yeah. And then once again, he has set multiple world records, and has even beaten his own world records. You know, uh, longest air, longest air off a ramp, highest air off a ramp. Um, I think he has the world record for for highest land speed uh, on. On, on a skateboard or something, and like other other like records like that, and everybody's like, "Oh, Tony Hawk did the first 900." A 12 year old did a 1080. Let me say that again. A 12 year old did a, a a 12 year old did a 1080. Yeah. Tony Hawk. Yeah, he was the first, but he's far from the best. Anyway, deserves way more recognition. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye. Don't actually fuck you. I'm actually not in that. I'm actually not in a bad mood, surprisingly, today.